Hey, it's Jim, and this is level three of the CFA program, topic on fixed income portfolio management, the reading on liability driven and index based strategies. This will be part two, where we take a look at some interest rate scenarios, and then we'll finish up with some indexing. Let me just quickly remind you what we did in part one. We talked about the different types of liabilities. We talked about immunization. We talked about uh, derivatives and duration and convexity. So we're going to continue looking at the final five LOSs here, which can pretty much be summarized by that first LOS. You know, here we are with fixed income securities. We're exposed to default risk, of course, but that's not uh, the topic that we're discussing in this in this reading, but interest rate risk. And so really, how do you manage interest rate risk? We did talk about a single liability. We did talk about multiple liabilities. Remember in that part one, I gave you the example, what was I going to spend $100,000 on my swimming pool in, uh, in my backyard? So let's go ahead and take a look at uh, pretty much a continuation of almost where we ended in part one, where we're considering in this, you know, this entire general idea of asset liability management, we're taking a look at a specific case of it, liability driven investing. And of course, I think I said this to you in part one, uh, this was uh, created by pension fund managers who had, well, look right there at that first arrow point, uh, type four liabilities, unknown size and timing of cash flows. So we need to use effective duration to determine that sensitivity to changes in yields. Now there's a good timeline with some notation that the reading uses. Notice W stands for a uh, number of years that a current employee has been working. X stands for the number of years until the employee is expected to retire. And then Y stands for the number of years that uh, the employee will be part of our obligation. We're going to have to pay his or her retirement benefits. Uh, it's interesting that the reading has one sentence uh, to describe X. You know, you're not quite sure exactly how long uh, an individual is going to take until he or she retires, but you have some guidelines, right? You know, some people want to retire at 62, some at 65, some at 67, some at 75. Uh, I have way too many children in my life. I'll be working until, uh, until probably I hit the death number all, all the way over on the right hand side. But the interesting sentence that uh, that the reading mentions is the number of years from retirement until death. And the sentence reads something like, well, the analyst is going to have to use some lots of research or some subjectivity coupled with objectivity because we really don't know how long people are going to live. And so notice that the those years on that far, the two timeline segments uh, to the right of today, they add the uncertainty in trying to manage uh, a pension fund. All right, two different ways to re measure retirement benefits here. Let me just do this quickly. Look at this uh, ABO right there at the top. And then the next slide has PBO. And I want you to look at that equation there in the middle. And I'll explain it here in just a second, but look at it. And I'm going to go back here and look at that thing. And you should be saying, wait a minute, Jim. They looked an awful lot like each other. And in fact, they do with just one uh, with just one slight adjustment. And I'll tell you about that here in when we hit the next slide. So let's look at this. Uh, one way to measure retirement benefits is through this accumulated benefits obligation. It's the legal liability today. It's really just a present value using current salaries and number of years of service. Hmm. I like that purple uh, arrow point there. This is really a good question on the exam. It's appropriate when the pension plan wants to convert from defined benefit to a defined contribution plan. So there we go is the formula. We're going to start with M, which is some kind of an accrual factor. We're going to go ahead and multiply it by G, which is the number of years that the employee has worked, multiplied by the current salary. And then we're going to divide that by one plus some discount rate. And, you know, the reading gives some guidance on 
which discount rate to use. I mean, you could use uh, you could use the risk free rate of interest. That's probably not right. You could use the required return from the capital asset pricing model. That's that's probably not right. But the reading suggests to use that yield on high quality corporate bonds. Of course, you need to define high quality corporate bonds. And the hope is that, you know, kind of the motivation behind this is that this pension uh, plan is uh, administered to the employees of a corporation that's a, a large corporation, right? And that they probably have a pretty good rating. And then notice we're going to multiply that by something over there on the right. That's uh, one over R minus one over, and then a whole bunch of other stuff over there. But you should remember that equation, at least a similar one from time value of money. And all we're doing is we're accumulating all of that time value money stuff. So that's an extra time value factor that uh, comes up with that uh, accumulated benefits obligation. Now, probably a better way to measure the pension obligation is through the PBO. This is what's normally reported in the financial statements. And most importantly, this is the number that determines the funded status, whether the fund has a surplus or whether the fund has a deficit. And as good wealth managers, we need to be aware of the size of the surplus or the size of the deficit because that will dictate how we're going to uh, fund this over on the lef left hand side of the balance sheet. I'm guessing you don't need me to tell you when a plan is overfunded and when it is underfunded. There it is right in the middle of the page. But notice the only difference between between this formula here and that formula there occurs in the numerator on the left hand side of the multiplication sign right after the current wage. We're going to multiply this but by one plus that's a lowercase w which is the uh, expected growth rate in salaries and we're going to raise that to the t which is the number of years remaining until the employee expects to retire. So that's pretty much the difference between PBO and ABO right here. Now notice the LOS asks us to evaluate. The LOS doesn't say anything like, hey, calculate, compute, or demonstrate. And when you look at the problems at the end of this reading, you're probably not going to have to use that formula in too much detail. But, you know, right there it is if you have to. All right, so we're going to use this uh, LDI strategy to manage the interest rate risk of a pension fund. So let's go down each column here. How are we going to do this with uh, interest rate risk? We're going to use effective duration. Now, the important thing about duration, and I said this to you, I think I said it to you in part one, but I'm certain I said it to you in level two and back in level one. Duration is a first derivative of the price yield relationship, which makes it a line. So duration is really good, especially effective duration in this case is really good at identifying the level of interest rate risk for small changes in the yield. But look at that second sentence that we have written down there. These are approximations because just first derivative and it ignores convexity, which is the second derivative, which we need to consider if there are large changes in the yield to maturity. Now, the way the reading couches this kind of uh, framework is it will, it will use the yield curve. Um, it will say something like, hey, the yield curve uh, shifts up, the entire yield curve shifts up, parallel shift by, uh, you know, 25 basis points or, or it shifts downward by 25 basis per points. So they'll talk about this in terms of the entire yield curve. Now we have this investment risk. So think about this on the, on the right hand side of our balance sheet as a pension plan. We've got these, well, let's just go back here. We have these projected benefits obligation, or we can measure it with the accumulate benefits obligation. But essentially, we need to make certain that we have enough cash on hand to pay the retired workers next week or next month, whenever that is. So on the left hand side of the balance sheet, we're going to use the firm's uh, contributions and any capital gains. And we're going to invest in, well, maybe some fixed income securities, 
We're going to invest in equity securities. We're going to invest in alternative securities. We're going to invest in you know anything that we think is appropriate to manage that risk over on the, well, that's why it's called LDI, right? The liability uh, driven part of the right hand side of the balance sheet. Now, we need to be super careful about this, because if you think about it, suppose we've got we've got this pension obligation on the right hand side, which is sensitive to interest rate changes. And then over here, we have a portfolio just of equity securities, just for some strange reason. Well, equities, of course, are sensitive to interest rate changes, but much differently than the right hand side of the balance sheet. Hmm. So that's why in that very bottom sentence, we have a decrease in interest rates can greatly increase this asset liability mismatch. So we need to worry about not only duration over here and now we haven't got to it yet convexity over here and then boy if we have equity securities what well, duration doesn't apply and convexity doesn't apply so we need to worry about things like you know beta and value at risk so that's that's what investment risk is because if we use equities or if we use anything other than fixed income on the left hand side of the balance sheet we're we're not matching now that goes against, you know, the title of this series of readings, right? Asset liability management. Well, in a perfect world, in a perfect world, we would have perfect assets that perfectly match the liabilities. But remember now, the goal of the pension fund manager is not only to meet those short-term obligations, but to grow a surplus on the left-hand side of the balance sheet to meet those future those future obligations. And so this is really cool stuff. I mean, pension fund managers, uh, they have tremendous challenges, but when they succeed, uh, it's tremendously satisfactory. All right, how about some other minor risks over here? Uh, longevity, salary growth, uh, retire at different times. So we talked about salary growth and different retirement dates before. And then, you know, let's just call this longevity, worrying about uh, how long uh, these retired employees uh, are going to live. So there's the formula for effective duration. You've seen this back in level two and notice it's just a ratio. All we're doing is taking the price of the bond or the bond portfolio when interest rates fall. There's the PV with the minus and we're going to subtract that the price uh, of the bond or the bond portfolio when interest rates increase. So this should make sense that the numerator is always positive, right? When interest rates go down, price goes up. When interest rates go up, price goes down. So that subtraction in the numerator is going to be uh, a positive number. And then we're going to take two uh, times the price of the bond. There's PV zero, that uh, initial price of the bond. And by the way, when I ask this question in my uh, in my uh, derivative securities class, um, I almost always, I'm not just saying, suggesting that the Institute will do this. I al almost always say something like, hey, that the price of that bond is currently at par value. So somewhere in the question stem, you don't have to be given a price. Somewhere it'll just say, maybe it'll say coupon and yield are the same thing. And you'll know that that price is, uh, is $1,000. But that's the current price. And then you multiply it by the delta of the yield curve, the change in the curve. And so some somehow the Institute will say, hey, suppose the yield curve, what did I say earlier? Uh, parallelly, is that a word, parallelly? It shifts in a parallel fashion by upward by 20 basis points or something like that. Now the two down there in the denominator, remember what I said to you, duration is, is a first derivative. So when you take derivatives, a lot of times you have a squared number and it throws over to the bottom and so you end up with a one half. So don't really worry about the two, just remember that there's a two in the denominator, it's actually a one half, so. Now, of course, what we're gonna do is we're going to take that effective duration of the assets and the liabilities. Now remember that effective duration is gonna be in essentially number of years, weighted average time to maturity. Remember we just in part one, we did the Macaulay and then we did the modified duration. And then what we can do is we can convert it to a, a dollar duration or, uh, or a, money, a money duration. And that's uh, the reading calls that a basis point value. Now look at that blue air, uh, di uh, circle point at the bottom. 
We know that when you invest in a portfolio of equity securities, you could hold on to those things for you know thousands of years, right? They don't have a maturity date. Same thing with lots of alternative investments, like uh, you know, like a, a Monet painting. You could have that painting, and I mean, it, it doesn't ever mature, right? You could hang it on your wall for a really, really long time. But what the readings suggest, and this is pretty much what uh, professionals say, is that those investments have a zero duration. Now, that is actually true. It doesn't mean they have a zero maturity date. So make sure you distinguish, uh, distinguish between those two. Now, here is the measure of the difference between what's going on on the right and left-hand sides of the balance sheet. This is called a duration gap. So look at the red and green. Uh, if that basis point value of the assets is less than the basis point value of the liabilities, we're gonna call that a negative duration gap. And skip down to the green, if the uh, reverse holds true, if the BPV of the assets is greater than of the liabilities, there is a positive duration gap. And so it's important to remember what happens to changes in interest rates and what the impact it's going to be on the, uh, on the surplus of the assets. So just remember down in the green, inverse relationship, up in the red, direct relationship. Now look down at the bottom. This is what I was at least saying, at least hinting at a, a few moments ago. Pension funds will have a large duration gap if, if they invest in equities, which of course they do, uh, that are assumed to have those zero effective durations and lots and lots of liability durations. So we're definitely going to have this gap unless, let me go back here just quickly. I mean, unless those there's not a greater than or less than sign. I mean, if there's an equal sign there, then our, our life is way simpler than it's uh, than it normally is. And it's a lot easier to manage. But of course, we're going to, we're most likely going to have a greater than or a less than sign in between those, uh, in between those two values. So the question then becomes, how is it possible for us to narrow that duration gap? Well, what we could do is we could just sell a bunch of the assets that we have over on the left-hand side and buy a bunch of new ones. So that makes perfect sense. But look at that final, uh, one of the final bullet points down there. Changing assets is very costly, right? So you got to pay taxes, well, pension funds. But if these are individuals, you have to worry about tax implications. Um, you have to worry about bid-ask spreads. You have to worry about adverse selection costs. You have to worry about liquidity issues. Uh, remember that, you know, when you when you go to the floor of the New York Stock Exchange and you want to sell, you know, 100,000 shares of Johnson & Johnson, you can do it pretty quickly, right? Liquidity like that. But if you want to sell 10,000 Johnson & Johnson bonds, the market is not nearly as liquid. All right, so there are lots and lots of reasons why you don't want to change the assets because, after all, Looking at the policy statement, we're selecting those assets in conjunction with risk objective and return objective and all that other kind of good stuff. So, of course, then the choice is, and this is a great answer. I try to teach my students, what's the answer to managing lots and lots of risk problems? And the answer is, let's find a derivative that is appropriate. So derivatives are way less costly. In fact, lots of them are, are free. I don't really want to say that they're free in the sense that they don't really cost anything, but lots of derivatives, you don't have to, uh, uh, with, uh, you don't have to uh, forego any current capital. Now, there are some practical issues there. So look up at the top in the blue and the red. If the hedging ratio is zero, uh, then we're doing no hedging. If the hedging ratio is 100%, then we have eliminated interest rate risk, and we call that an immunized portfolio. Now, this reading, both in, in part two, what we're doing today, and what we did uh, recently in part one, and the Institute really likes to ask these questions, and I do as well on my exams, is to go ahead and figure out the number of futures contracts. Uh, go ahead and figure out the number of options. Go ahead and figure out the notional on a swap. This is a standard kind of a question that all test creators ask. So here it is. Uh, in perfectly ratio terms, number of futures contracts, uh, take a look at the basis point value on from the liabilities, subtract the basis point value from the assets, 
and then uh, divide that by the derivative that you're using in this case, uh, in this case, a futures contract. So it makes sense that if we have interest rate risk, we're going to use an interest rate futures contract, like a treasury bond futures contract, uh, maybe even a treasury bill futures contract if, if we're trying to manage short term risk. But we're probably going to do treasury bonds out there because um, because we're managing interest rate risk over over an extended time period. Now, notice the LOS is continuing to ask us to evaluate and select a strategy. So we may we may have to compute the number of futures contracts, but I'm guessing it's going to be just a simple uh, a simple table where you could just take these numbers and go ahead and divide. The one complicating factor might be might be this concept of the cheapest to deliver. And you may have heard this story before, but I think it's 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 worth repeating. Um, if my if my wife tells me to go out and buy a, a, a Hoover vacuum cleaner and she says, I want this model, I'm going to go to Walmart and ask Sam Walton how much uh, he's charging. And then I'm going to go to a Target and then I'm going to go to Best Buy and I'm going to find this thing. I'm going to bring home the cheapest one, right? The cheapest to deliver. So remember that there are, oh my gosh, here we are uh, in the year 2023. And what do we have? We have, I don't even want to say it, but I'll go ahead and say it, $32 trillion worth of treasury securities out there. So if you're going to use a futures contract, there's going to be a treasury bond out there that's the cheapest, of course, given some standard terms, it's going to be the cheapest one and you're going to go out and find that one. Now, the cool thing is you don't really have to search for it. Everybody will know what that cheapest to deliver treasury bond is. So what was I saying just a moment ago before I told you that story about the vacuum cleaner? that uh, uh, you're going to find that cheapest to deliver and you may have to compute the, the denominator in that ratio. Now, what don't we like about futures contracts? I mean, these are these are perfect things. Uh, I mean, you can you can arrange a perfect hedge. You can hedge and, and here, let me go back here real quick. You can identify any hedge ratio that you want from zero to 100 percent and you can perfectly execute it. The problem is you have to worry about daily settlement. You have margin accounts, you might have a margin call, and every day yields go up, yields go down, and so those prices change, and so you have to worry about uh, marking to market. Now, of course, you can have an algorithm that just does this for you, but you still have to worry about it in case the market is moving against you or in your favor, and you want to maybe close out your position. Now, we can do the same thing with an interest rate swap. Um, remember back in level two, we spent lots of time on interest rate swaps and forward rate agreements. And we're going to do the same thing here. We can, we can reduce our hedge ratio by using these swaps. We can do just the opposite. And it probably depends on what we expect the uh, yield curve to do. So look at the green and the red arrows. If the current swap market rates are expected to increase, we probably want to reduce our, uh, our hedge ratio. If the current swap market rates are expected to fall, then we probably want to increase our hedging ratio. And there's a formula over there on the right. There's our uh, notional principle of the swap and notice the similarities here. Let me just go back here. There we go. There we go. <laughs> there we go. Still almost identical formulas there. So solving for that notional principle for this interest rate swap overlay. You can also do this with options. And in particular, you know, if we can buy an interest rate swap contract, then clearly there's an option on an interest rate swap. We call these swaptions. And so we can purchase a receiver swaption uh, as an alternative to that receive the fixed rate interest swap that we talked about on that previous slide. So look at the second diamond point. I like this one here. This is probably the most important part of this particular section. An interest rate de decline could result in underfunded pensions. And this is probably because there's that negative duration gap. 
Now you can do a collar. We spent a lot of time in level two and even in level three about the collar. You know, I'm going to go ahead and do this. Here are the payoffs for the collar. You know, you got this and then you have a little line going in between this. And so sometimes this swaption collar is going to narrow the choices of outcomes uh, at the end of a period. All right, this is a beautiful slide here. Go ahead and get out your phone and take a picture of this. Uh, if interest rates are expected to fall, we're going to use a receiver fixed swap. If interest rates are expected to increase, we're going to use that swaption collar. And if interest rates are expected to hit some kind of a level, you know, whether they go up or down, then we can use a purchase receiver swaption. Now, considering some of these extra practical issues, accounting and reporting requirements. You know, I always tell my students the story. Years ago, uh, there was a, one of the airlines used lots and lots of futures contracts to head their, hedge their energy risk. And of course, this was the right decision. Um, but what happened during some time period, I forget what it was, it might have just been a quarter or six months. And so uh, oil prices, they fell dramatically during that period. And so this airline company had to take a, uh, there was a loss in the futures market. And so the shareholders were saying, oh my gosh, why are you trading these risky derivative securities? And of course, accounting and reporting requirements, it, they're forced by the accounting people out there who know debits and credits that, well, of course, yeah, you took the long position in the, uh, in the futures contract. So, so the price, uh, so the price fell and you, uh, and you lost. Lack of understanding of derivatives. I love this one. Go back to 1994. I think that was the year. I'm not going to tell you the name of the company here, but it's a very famous company. Hopefully you use their products still every day. But this company wanted to hedge $40 million worth of interest rate risk. And back then it was the German mark and currency risk. $40 million they wanted to hedge. So they called up a bank that no longer exists called Bankers Trust. And they developed this crazy derivative security. And uh, this company uh, ended up losing $400 million on trying to uh, manage just $40 million. So it was really silly. So that is true, lack of an understanding of derivatives. So what, do I, what have I told you in level one and level two and level three? What we need to do is identify the risks, quantify the risks and measure the risks. Uh, I'll go ahead and just tell you it was Procter and Gamble. Now they did uh, all but three of those things when uh, when it uh, when it went through that uh, that debacle with Bankers Trust. It's really a fascinating story. Both sides uh, they sued each other, and I'm sure it got resolved, but I can't remember exactly how it was resolved. But it's still a clear example of look. It's so easy to get out your Excel spreadsheet and say, okay, here's where I am today, and then yield curve goes up, yield curve yield curve goes down by, you know, however many basis points, you can do this in multiple uh, spreadsheets. And then there's your answer. You can say, oh, here's my surplus or here, here's the impact on the assets, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, it's super easy to do all those kinds of things. And then this is what we were talking about, that I, what I was talking about earlier, collateral margin requirements. So there's liquidity, operational and counterparty risk. Remember that operational risk does use, it has the word operations in there, but it also includes not just the physical element of doing stuff, but also the, the human element of accomplishing all of the diff different tasks. So don't forget that uh, human error goes, uh, goes into that. I'll tell you a quick story about operational risk in my family. Uh, uh, my wife and I have recently, recently um, tried to um, change the cartridge, the mowing cartridge in my daughter's uh, bathtub. Have you ever done that? That's the definition of operational risk. We, uh, we succeeded, but man, oh man, we almost destroyed my daughter's bathroom. But now she can take a shower. That's uh, perfectly fine. All right. How about risks associated with this? This is a good, uh, this is a good LOS. Watch this. Let me just go through these quickly here. There's model risk, there's spread risk, there's counterparty, collateral, liquid. All right. So there's a whole bunch of those risks that we're going to have to uh, talk about here. And I can envision a question where you, you know, you have a bunch of things 
in the question stem and the institute will say, hey, which kind of risk uh, is this pension fund exposed to? So there's a good relationship up there for a full interest rate hedge. So this is kind of like a, it's not really a weighted average, but it's kind of a weighted average. So look at the asset BPV times the change, right? And then the hedge, some kind of derivative BPV, and that is going to equal the liability. So think about there's those little curvy equal signs there. That means uh, it's not equal, but it's, it's probably pretty close to being equal. So look on the left-hand side of those two squiggly lines. This is your left-hand side, right? The asset side of the balance sheet. You have the assets plus, plus the layered derivative in there, and then that has to equal the liability on the right-hand side of the balance sheet. So let's go ahead and talk about these. We can, we can do these pretty quickly. I think we've covered a bunch of these, not just here in level three, but in level one and level two. So model risk, think about the Excel spreadsheet. What kind of assumptions did we make about wages and retirement? Did we pick uh, the accumulated? Uh, did we pick PBO? What kind of yields did we decide on? And in fact, we have this spreadsheet. Did we do the math right? You know, we can write a macro and we could do all sorts of really cool things inside of Excel, but did we do it the correct way? Did we reflect the accurate measure of interest rate risk? Did we consider both duration and convexity? And then uh, remember that duration and convexity, these things only work for parallel shifts. Remember in that part one, what do we call that structural risk? In fact, that's one of the answers to an exam question, at, not an exam question, an end of reading question that I'll talk about uh, in just a few minutes. All right, spread risk. We've talked about this since, uh, since level one, right? Here's the government yield and here is the yield to maturity on these high quality corporate bonds. Remember, that's the discount rate that we're using or some similar discount rate. So we can have spreads that go this way. We can have spreads that go this way. We can worry about their volatility. Oh my gosh. So there's lots of worry about with spread risk. But just remember that changes in those yields are not going to be felt equally on the left and the right hand side of the balance sheet. Uh, counterparty credit risk. Um, you know, I always tell my students that when you go to the New York Mercantile Exchange or the Chicago Mercantile Exchange is that they have these clearinghouse corporations, right? The Institute calls them CCPs, Central Clearing Parties. And so they write contracts separately with each long and short position. And so these CCPs, they're, they're not poor people, right? They're probably pretty wealthy individuals or organizations or businesses or however they're, however they're created and arranged. So on the futures exchange, that counterparty credit risk is probably not too high, but with over-the-counter derivatives, then throw that right out the window. So make sure when we layer the derivative on top of the assets that we know who we're dealing with. If it's the futures exchange, I mean, if it's Jim's futures exchange, then maybe you need to worry about it, right? Or dare I say, boy, what was that uh, cryptocurrency uh, futures exchange that has been in the news lately. Uh, collateral exhaustion, uh, the possibility of exhausting collateral. Yeah. So sometimes we have to put up collateral and we put it up here and then we put it up here and then we put it up here and then something happens to yields and the value of that collateral changes. You might remember, I think it was back in uh, in level two where I introduced the concept, the best collateral at all comes from one of my favorite movies out there. And I hope it's one of your favorite movies. And of course, Steve Martin did a great job with the Pink Panther that was out, I don't know, a decade ago. But go all the way back to uh, Peter Sellers in the 1960s and 70s with those Pink Panther movies. The Pink Panther Diamond, this would be the greatest, the greatest uh, collateral that everyone, that anyone ever submitted to uh, to layer the pension fund assets. Liquidity risk, we, we did talk about that. Contingent immunization, that should be uh, super obvious. Uh, yield curve risk, this was that structural stuff that we were talking about. So we have these non-parallel shifts in the yield curve. Maybe they're non, maybe they go like this, or maybe they twist, right? Maybe lower yields increase and uh, longer yields decrease, so you have non-parallel shifts. Now, the way to handle this is through what's known as key rate duration. So you 
you have all of the so for the pension fund you know we have these key points along the chrono uh, the the time scale on the bot on the right hand i'm sorry on the horizontal axis and so you find a key rate so we might say something like you know what I think there are going to be 29 employees retiring in six years. So that's probably a key rate. You know, maybe in year five, there'll be two. And in year seven, there's one. So, but there's a key rate and we want to identify that key rate so that if the yield curve does something crazy, a non-parallel shift, we have lasered in on that key rate duration. All right, so that takes us through the first part of the title of this reading. Now let's go into indexing. And the good news for you candidates is that everything you learned in level one and level two about equity indexing applies here. Now there are some subtle differences that I'm guessing the Institute will probably laser in on uh, to answer questions. So look at these first two slides. We've got three columns and they continue here on the next slide. So let's go ahead and uh, and look at these three columns. So what's the goal of an indexer? The goal of an indexer is to find a portfolio of assets that, I'm gonna say a word here, and I don't really mean it, but I'm gonna say it, that exactly mimics the performance of an index. Exactly mimics, mimics the performance of a bond index. So that there's no variability between the two. Right? This means that the standard deviation of the active return is going to be zero, and there's no tracking error, and there's no tracking risk. Now, let's take a deep breath. What we know is that especially, and in particular in the fixed income market, these bond indexes over here, they got tons and tons of them. So it's very costly to have that exact mimicry. Is that a word, mimicry? That's two times in this uh, recording I've asked you if that's a word. All right, so what are we going to do? Let's go down this first column here. Pure index, full replication approach. Strictest, most expensive. Its aim is to replicate the benchmark, minimizes tracking risk, and turnover is similar to that of the underlying benchmark. So what's going to happen here is that this is probably going to be used infrequently because it is so costly. I mean, think about it. if you have a thousand bonds over here. I mean, if you have a thousand uh, uh, liabilities on the right hand side of the balance sheet and that contains the index and then you've got these bonds that you're going to buy over here and that is supposed to contain. Are you going to buy a thousand and a thousand? Well, sooner or later, you're going to say something like, you know, I have 900 of these. Do I really need to buy the 900 in first? The 900 looks pretty good. <laughs> it's not perfect, but it looks pretty good. Ah, so ready enhanced indexing. That's exactly what I'm talking about. Buy fewer securities to match the benchmark's primary risk factors. Oh, my heavens. So remember, we talked about that uh, uh, Fama and French. What did they do? They came up with this idea of factors in addition to the beta, the systematic risk of an equity portfolio, they came up with some other factors. So what are some factors? Spread risk, yield curve risk, duration. I mean, they could be almost any factor. So we're going to use a factor analysis to take a look at those 1000 bonds in the index. And we're going to say something like, oh, you know what? These 75, they capture almost all of the spread risk of this entire 100 so, uh, or the entire 1,000. I don't need to buy 1,000. I just need to buy 75 for duration. I need to buy 35 for spread risk. I need to buy 22 for yield curve risk. So there we go. Enhanced indexing. We use stuff that we learned back in our quantitative methods to make our life easy. Now, of course, what's going to happen here loosens restrictions. And the goal of this, I mean, you can use some uh, optimization here that uh, it's going to minimize that tracking error. You're not going to have tracking error like this. It's going to be not zero like that full replica replication, but it might be something like this. Slightly higher turnover. Uh, and notice the bottom one. More practical. Now, how about active management? Of course, this means that 
what we're going to do is we're going to say, all right, here's 1,000 of these bonds in the index. Well, we're not going to buy 1,000. We're only going to buy, we're only going to buy 58 of them. And we're going to overweight some of these things. We're going to underweight some of these. We might even substitute some, uh, some bonds in for, you know, like here's bond 39. We don't like that bond. I'm going to substitute another one in there. What does that say there? Portfolio weights are significantly different from those are the benchmark. So they deviate from the interest rate risk. So this is what's happening here. If we think that interest rates are going to fall, we want to overweight in those bonds that have lots and lots of duration and lots and lots of convexity. So when the yields fall, then that overweighting results in lots and lots of capital gain. But of course, with active management, we have to worry about portfolio turnover and we need to worry about tracking error. Now, here's a good slide to kind of summarize what I'm saying here. Why replicating a bond market index is so difficult. Size, right? The, the breadth and depth of the bond markets. Uh, as I was reading um, through this material, I took a pause and I went to um, a couple of bond ETFs, which we'll talk about here in just a second, and actually went to the web page of the actual creator of the ETF. And you have to you have to find it's under an annual report might be in the prospectus. I didn't really look at that, but in the annual report, it lists all the bonds that are contained in that particular ETF, which in my case, I, I went to find, you know, it was, it was mimicking a particular index. And so boy, page after page after page of different kinds of bonds. Now they were divided by sector. So they were kind of easy to keep track of. So remember that broad bond markets relative to equity markets. Yeah, different characteristics of fixed income securities, right? There are two-year bonds, there are 10-year bonds, there are 20-year bonds, there are 50-year bonds, there's 100-year bonds. I've said this to you before, Walt Disney and Coca-Cola in the late 1990s issued 100-year bonds. Different ratings. So this is where we inject uh, the, to the conversation a measure of default risk. Remember now, in the policy statement, it might say something like, hey, we only want bonds that have a rating of C or double C. I mean, that sounds silly, but you could put that in the, uh, uh, in the policy statement. I used to serve on a nonprofit. I was on the investment committee. I did this for about a decade until I, I needed to move on with my life. But in the policy statement, we had decided, and I wasn't a huge fan of this, but we had decided that we only wanted uh, investment grade bonds in the portfolio. And the uh, wealth managers would come to us, you know, once or twice a year and say, boy, I really, I really have some really great uh, double B rated bonds that we think we should add to the portfolio. And then we would vote on them and we probably said that it was OK. Let's go ahead and and change, you know, some of some of the points of the policy statement. Uh, what else? Um, you know, puttable bonds, callable bonds, convertible bonds, floating rate bonds, fixed rate bonds, you know, all this. All right, how about primary indexing risk factors? Portfolio modified adjusted portfolios, uh, uh, adjusted duration. So what do we need to worry about? Small parallel shifts are going to change the value of our portfolio and we're gonna use effective duration to do that. We're gonna make a convexity adjustment and we can do this in the Excel spreadsheet that I, I talked about uh, earlier. Of course, effective durations for bonds with embedded uh, options. Here we go. Key rate duration. This is exactly what I was saying just a few moments ago. What we're going to do is we, if we manage these key rate durations, because that key rate is at a key point along the timeline uh, of our bond portfolio, then we need to say something like, oh, if that key rate goes up or that key rate goes down, then this is what the result is going to be. And then this is how we're going to manage it. This is a great question on the exam. You get a key rate duration, you know, say it's, you know, whatever it is at year 10, and then, uh, you, you know, maybe do some calculations in there. And then the question stem says something like, oh, oh, what happens uh, to the value of the portfolio if the yield goes up? And you say, wait a minute, wait a minute. What did I say? 10 years? Let's do a, oh, I'm going to have to make this up now. Let's do a, a 10 year option. Of course, you can't get an option for 10 years, but, you know, go back in time to, let's say, two years or one year. Then you can overlay, overlay uh, 
these key rate risks with some kind of a derivative. Sector and quality percentages, of course, ideally in full replication, we'll do a perfect match on either side, but uh, we're going to have deviations from that as well. Sector duration, that's just a, uh, an average there. Spread duration, that of course is just an average, but here spread duration is going to be a measure of interest rate risk, a measure of how the bond and the bond portfolio's value changes whether the spread goes like this or it widens or narrows. Um, one of the first things that I teach my investments class is the duration convexity relationship. And so I have them draw duration and then I have them draw convexity and we do this in Excel and I can draw it on the board. And then I say, what happens if it's a callable bond? And remember now the callable bond, it has negative convexity. So boy, how do we do that? Because the convexity of a callable bond is one thing out here when yields are uh, when yields are high and it's another thing when yields are low because of course nobody refinances at high rates they all refinance at low rates and so look at that second arrow point matching convexity can be very costly because a a it's difficult to measure that convexity that's why that's why what's going to happen is that we're probably going to match not just individual bonds, but match sector, match coupon, match maturity. So those kinds of things can maybe offset, it's not gonna be perfect, but maybe offset that lack of precision in the convexity calculation. Uh, how about issuer exposure? Uh, large enough to minimize issuer specific event risk, like a bankruptcy. So we don't wanna have a bond in our portfolio that is going to go bankruptcy and then impact the entire index. Now, how can we match this curve risk, this present value of the distribution of cash flows? Because remember, remember, essentially, we want the cash flows generated from the assets to match the cash flows that are were legally obligated inside of this pension fund. And so you can go through this. This math is pretty easy. Uh, we're just going to divide. We're going to calculate present value. We're going to multiply. And then we're going to add each period duration to get that total bond index duration. And so I was thinking about this. And I'm not quite sure exactly how the Institute could ask this question here um, without giving you some good math in there. But that doesn't really equate to, uh, uh, to the LOS. Uh, let's go ahead and talk about full replication uh, just a little bit. If we are fully replicating, that means that active managers um, are, uh, cannot consistently outperform after adjusting for risk, right? So managers cannot identify that skill and underperformance is probably not tolerated there. Maintaining this exact proportion, significant purchase and sales. We talked about this earlier with the cost. Neither feasible nor cost effective. And so this is a summary table from what, uh, what I suggested earlier. Now, what we can do, you ready for this? We can do um, mutual funds. We can do exchange rated funds. We can do swaps and we can enhance. So let's go ahead and go through these quickly. Of course, we know about mutual funds. You don't need me to tell you uh, anything about mutual funds. But what we're going to do is we're going to say something like, hey, We've got these liabilities over here. Maybe a mutual fund is going to help us. Now, of course, in this part of the reading, we're expanding beyond just our conversation that includes uh, pension fund management. So that's why I look in the, uh, in the orange, suitable for small investors, right? Do not have a maturity date. You don't have to worry about paying off um, an employee over time. Ex exchange traded funds, you know from level one, the difference between mutual funds and ETFs. They trade on an exchange, super liquidity because you can sell them during the course of the day. Uh, look at the bottom there. Remember we had this conversation about these authorized participants um, that um, 
over time may or may not have an arbitrage opportunity. And remember what I, I said to you back in those old time, old time readings, that it's those arbitrage opportunities that make sure that the exchange traded fund is selling at, uh, at its uh, fair price. Now we have talked about total return swaps. This means that we're going to get a capital gain and dividend if it's a total equity swap. If it's fixed income, we'll get uh, we'll get interest plus the capital gain. And so you can arrange these things uh, almost any way that you want. You can say, you know what, I'm going to go ahead and pay the floating rate total rate and receive a fixed, or I'm going to I'm going to pay a floating rate and receive uh, a, a different a different floating rate. And of course, this all depends on what those liabilities look like, right? We're going to use this, engage in a total return swap so that we can offset those liabilities on the right-hand side of the balance sheet. Uh, enhanced indexing, what the reading emphasizes here is that, you know, this is cheaper. And we talked about different types of enhanced indexing procedures. There's one that they mentioned down there at the bottom, the stratified sampling, cell-based approach. Uh, you, can, you can do this in uh, you know, almost any kind of a format. But what the reading does mention, and the Institute is very big on environmental, social, and corporate governance factors, in addition to any other uh, social awareness factors to uh, identify appropriate bonds. So remember when we did that, uh, when we did that factor analysis where we identified, well, let's just pick one, you know, like uh, uh, spread risk. Well, what you could do is you could look at that, those, what did I have, 1,000 of those bonds in the index, and we can say, you know what, there are 72 of them that have particular high ESG scores, so we want to include those because that will, uh, that will enhance the performance of our portfolio if, if of course, those ESG factors are uh, wealth increasing. All right, lower cost for an, an uh, enhanced indexing, sector or quality enhancements. We can overweight or underweight a particular sector. So this is why back in level one, we do that macroeconomic analysis and we say something like, look, we're going to evaluate the entire macro economy and then we're going to look at each individual industry or sector. So we're experts on sectors out there. And so we might want to over or underweight the sector or what did I say earlier? C-rated bonds or uh, double C-rated bonds. Ah, bond valuation models can identify undervalued. Now, remember when I said in part one, I held up my calculator and I said, you know what? These five time value of money buttons, they're going to give us the present value or the price of a bond, but we're probably not going to use those to identify undervalued. We're probably going to need an Excel spreadsheet. You know, we might need an interest rate tree that we did back in level two. Uh, we need yield curve increase, decrease, both in parallel shifts and in twists to be able to identify those, uh, those uh, undervalued or overvalued. Um, yes, if we have callable bonds, then we need to be very, very sensitive to changes in yield, in particular, in particular, drops in yield because that increases the probability that the bonds or those bonds in our portfolio um, will be called. Uh, and then depending on what we think about the expected term structure, whether we use the current yield curve or spot curve or forward curve, we're going to overweight or underweight whatever securities that we think are overvalued or undervalued. Now, to select that benchmark, we've got to go ahead back to the policy statement. We've got our risk and return objectives. We have the client constraints and we've established a strategic asset allocation. And probably that strategic asset allocation is going to be a range. Let's say, you know, we want uh, we want to have investment grade bonds to be uh, 75 to 85 percent of the portfolio. So we allow a little range in there and then we're going to allow for tactical changes there. Boy, we did this before, right? The, the benchmark has to be investable. We need to worry about the weights. We need to know if it's equal weighted or market weighted or some other crazy weighting scheme. 
We probably need to make sure we can value all these things on a daily basis. We need to look at history. We need to worry about turnover. Uh, let's say we talked about this before. Bond indexes are not perpetual because the bonds mature. Uh, value weighted index. This has this bums problem. You know, this is kind of an interesting uh, uh, scenario. Take a look at an index and you got, uh, let's say, a couple of firms in there and these firms have lots of debt and these firms have lots of debt and lots of debt. So what's their probability of default and their loss given default and exposure and all those measures of, of credit risk? Well, those are going to dominate the performance of the portfolio. That's called a bum, right? These are bum issues. Uh, boy, let's go into this concept of a smart beta. What are we trying to do here? This is just a rules based strategy so that they're probably simple. They're probably transparent. A rules based strategy might be something like, hey, if something happens over here, then we're going to do this or this or this. And we're going to choose from among those three alternatives that has the best outcome. Remember, we talked about rules based strategies multiple times. And that takes us through all nine of these LOSs. Part one, we did the first four. Part two, we did the next five. So what I want you to do now is I want you to go to the end of this reading and work on those. I think there are 25 or 27 questions at the end of the reading. I think we've prepared you to answer those uh, at least in a passable framework. I think you might be a little disappointed because I think all but two of them are in a multiple choice format. But nevertheless, there are questions in there on almost every one of these LOSs. So I had fun during this one here. I hope you guys did too. Thank you for watching uh, and good luck studying.